I've got a city builder to share with you that's unlike any other I've ever played, and for good reason. And if city builders aren't your usual cup of tea, stick around anyway, because today I'm going to share what makes this game so unique, and hopefully help you make a decision as to whether or not you should play it for yourself. If you didn't get a chance to play The Wandering Village back when it was out on Steam's Next Fest in 2022, the Wandering Village is a city builder where not only do you have to manage your village like you do in pretty much every other game of the genre, but also the literal ground you walk on, because that ground just so happens to be the back of a dragon-like creature named Anbu, resulting in a city builder that's not so much focused on mass industrialization and colonization, but instead a symbiotic relationship between your village and the creature on which it's built upon. Oh, and quick fun fact, the name of the creature, Anbu, is actually Japanese and loosely translates to to receive a piggyback ride. <laughs> Quite fitting, if you ask me. The Wandering Village was successfully funded on Kickstarter back in 2020 and is being released into early access on Steam in just a few days on September 14th, 2022. I was kindly provided with an early review key from the developers, Stray Fawn Studio, to check the game out, and in the roughly five hours I've spent in it so far, I've had an absolute blast. They're not sponsoring me or this video in any way, and my thoughts are 100% my own, but they have sent over two Steam keys for me to give away, which I'll be talking more about later in the video. When you first start out, you're tasked with getting the basic food, water, and housing needs met, because of course, keeping your villagers happy and, well, alive, is the key to a productive village. To build these basic items, resources are required, of course, but thankfully, Anbu has a bountiful supply of rocks for stones and trees for wood scattered all across its back for some reason. Or so it seems. As you continue to grow and expand your village, you'll eventually get to a point where the resources readily available on Anbu itself aren't enough, at which point you'll have a few options. You can employ researchers to grant access to the research tree, allowing you to unlock sawmills and quarries to take advantage of the large stumps and boulders on Anbu's back that can't be collected by hand. But eventually, even those two will run dry. In addition, building a scavenger hut will allow you to send adventuring parties into the surrounding environment to collect all sorts of resources, including wood, stone, sand, iron. They'll even come across the occasional group of wanderers, which you can then bring back to increase your population. Because in the wandering village, your villagers cannot reproduce, nor can they die, at least not from old age. You can also randomly come across wanderers as Anbu travels, naturally resulting in an ever-growing population, if, that is, you choose to allow them on board. In addition to the houses that you'll need to build for your expanding population, there are 43 different buildings that can be placed down, and only a few of those, namely houses and storage options, are upgraded versions of each other. The remaining 35 plus buildings all have unique functions that all play a vital role in your village's longevity. And as far as I can tell, there's no limit in how many of each you can build. That might sound a bit overwhelming, but the game's tutorial, which I highly recommend playing with for the first time, does a fantastic job of explaining not only what to build and when, but more importantly, why. There are even a few buildings that have to be built in a specific location, which, keeping in mind that we're building on the back of a living creature, makes total sense. A horn blower can be built and is used to issue commands to Anbu, influencing its behavior, but can only be placed near the front, as that's where Anbu's ears are. You can also feed Anbu using a massive trebuchet to catapult food into its mouth to satiate its hunger, which is again required to be placed towards the front where Anbu's mouth is. And because Anbu is a living being that eventually passes the food that it eats, you can also build an aptly named Dung Collector to harvest its droppings to be further refined into usable materials. And I'll give you one guess as to where that building has to go. <laughs> There are also even more complex buildings that can, for example, extract bile from Anbu's gallbladder, which, having anatomy just like you and I do, only exists in one place within its body, requiring you to place it in that one spot and one spot only, directly above Anbu's gallbladder. These little details and space requirements for certain buildings only add to the connection you feel with the creature you're building a village upon. It's so cool. There's a dark side to this too, though. As the player, you're not only given options to positively interact with Anbu, 
but also to extract its blood, install a deep quarry to drill for stone deep within its back, or build injectors allowing you to inject liquefied food or quote, other substances into Anbu directly. All of these can and will have consequences, ranging from damaging Anbu's trust in you to actually causing it physical harm, reducing its health. I haven't personally tried any of these things yet as I couldn't bring myself to do them, but please know that these are 100% not required to do. They all provide a positive impact for the village at the expense of Anbu. But keeping in mind the symbiotic nature of the relationship here, a balance must be met because if Anbu dies, which it absolutely can, it's game over. On a less gruesome note, the game is called The Wandering Village for a reason. Anbu will continually wander the world, traveling through various biomes such as green, lush jungles, beautiful pink mountainscapes, and arid, sandy, dry deserts, just to name a few. Each biome will offer different resources for your adventuring parties to scavenge, be that wood in the jungle, stone in the mountains, sand in the desert, and so on, as well as different temperature, humidity, and toxicity levels, which all play an important role. Temperature has the biggest impact on your crops, with each crop having preferred temperature ranges, indicated by this colored bar here. Green being the optimal 100% growth speed, yellow being less so, growing at 60% of that growth speed, gray being far from ideal, resulting in no growth whatsoever, and red being absolutely unlivable for the crop, meaning your crops will die and start to decompose. As a result of this, a bit of micromanaging is required to ensure you're growing the right crops at the right times, depending on the climate. But luckily, it's super quick and easy to change that up on the fly. Humidity will also affect how well your air wells function, which automatically extract water from the air to be used for farming. This scale ranges from 0 to 200% efficiency, meaning ample water storage will be a huge help in getting through arid areas like deserts, which will result in zero water being collected, as will growing cacti, which is another water source alternative to air wells. And lastly is the toxicity level, which not only differs by biome, but also from air to ground. If Anbu is traveling on foot, the air toxicity is what plays into effect. But if it is lying down or sleeping, then contact with the ground means that the ground's toxicity will come into play. All of this affects how quickly Anbu's poison level rises, resulting in health loss if it gets too high. Thankfully though, there's plenty of ways to interact with Anbu, including to decrease its poison level. After building that horn blower we talked about earlier, you can instruct Anbu to lie down, walk, or run. All of these can be used in conjunction to help move Anbu along at a better pace. Why would this be helpful though? There are some roaming bands of wanderers, for example, that if intersected on Anbu's path, will be willing to join you. So getting there early maybe, and instructing Anbu to lie down, or asking Anbu to run to catch up with them are just two ways of trying to accomplish this. These can also be used to avoid some natural environmental disasters. More on this in a bit. Additionally, you can also research the ability to command Anbu to sleep or to eat, giving you even more control, as well as attempt to tell it which way to go when you come to a fork in the path you're traveling on. With all these commands, however, Anbu isn't guaranteed to listen to you if it doesn't trust you. By building an Anbu doctor, however, your villagers can not only cure Anbu of poison, but also heal it over time and even pet it to slowly increase its trust in you. How adorable. And through the feeding trebuchet, you can not only feed it food to decrease its hunger, but also give it laxatives and constipators, influencing Anbu's digestion speed, but also the rate at which Anbu defecates, which might sound silly, but if you have a massive farm struggling to keep your large population alive, Adding fertilizer, which comes from Anbu's dung, can help speed up your crop's growth. Everything has a purpose. Anbu also has a heart rate that is displayed in the upper right corner, which increases when Anbu runs and decreases when it sleeps, influencing the rate of production at certain buildings, such as the bile extractor, for example. And yes, Anbu has a need to sleep, preventing how far and how fast you can travel at once. Once rested though, Anbu will return to traveling, and on those travels, you'll come across quite a few different encounters. 
some good, some not so good. On the good side of things, you'll come across feeding spots where Anbu can restore its hunger naturally, and resting spots, which are completely toxin-free, for Anbu to spend the night at and get a solid night's sleep, poison-free. On the not-so-good side of things, there are plenty. Tornadoes, tamely called thunderstorms in this game, that can wreak absolute havoc on your buildings, requiring you to spend quite a bit of time, thankfully not resources, on rebuilding them. There are also heat waves and cold snaps, which are random periods of intense heat or cold, usually out of character for the current biome, potentially killing off your current crops if you don't plan in advance. My personal favorite, however, are the poison spore clouds that you can occasionally come across, which when passing through, cause toxic plants to grow all over Anbu's back, which spread, if not taken care of quickly, can infect and kill your trees, and must be removed as soon as possible, either by your average villager who risks getting poisoned themselves in the process, or by specialized ones working at a decontaminator building who are immune to poison and use gas and fuel to burn away the toxic plants. Don't worry too much if your villagers get poisoned though, as you can employ village doctors to cure them with herbs. If you don't, however, you'll soon have a dead villager. As I said though, these spore cloud events are easily my favorite, as nasty as they are, because if you don't get a handle on them early on, they can get out of hand and quick. There is just so much to this game, and we haven't even talked about the amazing hand-drawn art style, the beautiful environmentally fitting music, the unique looks that the villagers take on as they're given new jobs, Twitch chat integration allowing villagers to be named after viewers and for chat to dictate Anbu's movements, three difficulty settings, the fact that it's available in 15 different languages, and so on. They plan to work on the game while it's in early access for at least a year before its full release, during which time they plan to make the game available on Xbox in addition to PC, which it already is, add controller support, improve the UI as well as the AI of the villagers, and implement some of the stretch goals from their Kickstarter campaign, including the ability to tame birds, which can become pets or help out with foraging and scouting, adding two new biomes, including a water biome and a ruins biome, and flying merchants to trade rare resources and artifacts with. All right, let's talk giveaway stuff. For those of you interested in winning one of the free Steam keys that Strayfon Studio sent over for The Wandering Village, all you have to do is like the video and leave a comment below with your thoughts on the game. You don't even have to be subscribed. I'll then pick two random comments from this video on Wednesday, September 14th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and work with those two winners to get them their keys. Once again, the game goes into early access on September 14th, 2022, and if you're interested at all in this game, I'll have links to their Discord, website, and Steam page down in the description. I have had a blast with this game so far, and I plan to stream it over on Twitch if you'd care to come watch, hang out, or simply ask some questions about the game. I'll have my link in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, though. I really hope you enjoyed, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. My name has been Dr. D-Dub, and until next time, as always, take care.